Welcome again after the uh, coffee break. Um, I'm now very pleased to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker. He's the researcher uh, working uh, with the psychedelic research group at Imperial uh, College in London. Uh, he has been involved for nine years in the brain imagining and uh, psychopharmacological uh, studies with uh, psilocybin, MDMA and uh, DMT. Now, in his talk, he's uh, going to uh, synthesize uh, his uh, knowledge uh, in the presentation titled uh, Psychedelic Compounds uh, and uh, for Effective uh, Symptoms. So please uh, welcome here Dr. David Erizzo. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I put almost the same uh, title as in the program, but it's it's kind of the same thing, just worded differently, sorry. Um, and thank you so much uh, for inviting me and other uh, of my lovely colleagues that we are very pleased to be here from representing Imperial um, College. Um, it's at an amazing, I don't think I've been to a conference where that many people can sit down and have real food, it's quite amazing. And there's uh, actually sparkling water coming out of the taps, and it's amazing. So, <laughs> Really well done. Um, and also thank you for, it's also very rare that I see my name spelled in Danish in the program because I am Danish and the Ö in my last name I haven't seen for a decade now but suddenly it, it came back. I have it tattooed here because I, I left it uh, 10 years ago and then people think it's because I really like the London transportation system because it's the same symbol but anyway. that. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do um, at Imperial. You have already heard um, some about it already, um, both in this session and Mendel spoke in the other session, in the other room, um, about the music part um, and uh, Ross and James about uh, the act, the component of what we are doing. So let us get started. So this is going to be basically the, the overview. It's not really a perfect overview. You can see the, the references are loosely put here because there are a lot of uh, papers by Robin Card Harris describing uh, the work we have been doing over a decade basically in, in, in healthy people. So we started out doing psilocybin in healthy people with intravenous injections of two milligram of psilocybin, both first in a mock scanner, so in a fake MRI scanner to see if it was possible, and then done quite a lot of work uh, with different modalities of, of e MRI, both um, blood flow and, and um, other kinds, and also EEG and MEG meshes. So all these papers are out there for you guys uh, to read if you are very interested about the imaging part. Um, I'm only going to very briefly highlight uh, a little bit of it on, on this slide because now we have moved uh, on a bit. We are still doing stuff in Healthy and um, the, the stuff we are doing at the moment is uh, Chris Timmerman is doing a DMT trial with um, combined EEG and fMRI and, and some of the data he's already published but more is coming out from, from that study. It's, it's quite exciting stuff. And then Taylor, PhD student in our lab, she has uh, just started recently together with some colleague medics to, to do a trial in healthy psychedelic naive because that we haven't done before. All our trials in healthy have been in people who had experiences before with psychedelics. So now we're also doing um, imaging in healthy people who have not tried psychedelics. Um, and as you can see, we've done different studies um, also with LSD, also with MDMA. Um, the, the main thing I would say that we have found with um, psilocybin, because that is the compound that I'm going to focus on, because that's the one we have brought into the clinical uh, studies. Um, we have seen that the blood flow goes down, it decreases, particularly within this sort of self-reflective network called the default mode network. Um, and part of that network is the medial prefrontal regions. And if you look at, and remember this is all healthy I'm talking about so far. If you look at the depression literature and look at all the studies that have been doing, um, that have been done where people have measured MRI, um, neural activity, one of the things that come out in meta-analysis is 
as a consistent finding is that the medial prefrontal cortex seems to be hyperactive in depression. That's one of the sort of most consistent findings with MRI and depression. And what we saw in these healthy studies was that that uh, activity in that area of the brain went down. And not only did it go down isolated in that area, but also as part of its own network, the default mode network, and also some of the um, regions within that network that seem to be too correlated, too functionally connected to each other in that default mode network, some of those connectivities were broken down when we tested it in healthy. And because we see the opposite in depression, that was part of the reason why we took this drug into depression. Also, for a lot of other historical reasons and clinical reasons, but from a neuroscience point of view, those were boxes ticked on the list of why it made sense for us to, to bring it further. Um, this is actually the, the author of this paper is Petri, it's actually not Robin who's the first author on that one, but that's a mathematical model of what we saw in the healthy brains with um, psilocybin and, and probably a lot of you have seen it because it has been used in a lot of different contexts. It went totally viral because it's so pretty. Um, and it's, it's a nice way of actually illustrating what's happening. So each color represents a different um, network, functional network of the brain. So you can see that over here you have all these, uh, uh, these are yellow, these are different brain areas that belongs to a network. And normally in the placebo state, they communicate that they are functionally connected within its own network. And what suddenly happens in the psychedelic state is that that is broken down suddenly, uh, uh, brain areas are functionally connected way beyond their own networks, across networks. So not only are the functional connectivity within the network that is too uh, expressed in depression, broken down, but also you see this sort of more fluid state where the brain communicates more chaotically across and there's a higher degree of entropy, chaos uh, in the brain systems. So that's what, what um, we have seen in the healthy. And um, then a little bit about the pharmacology. So you might have heard it already in some of the previous talks today, but um, one thing we know about the psychedelics in, in general is that they are agonists of the serotonin 2A receptor. So there are diff 14 different targets in the, in the serotonin system. One of them is the 2A receptor. And that they're agonists, that means that they stimulate the receptors. They do the same as serotonin itself does. Serotonin obviously is an agonist that stimulates the, the different receptors. So basically, uh, the psychedelics, they mimic uh, what serotonin is doing on that specific receptor. It also has affinity, it also stimulates other receptors in the system, but mainly the 2A. And uh, because of work done by colleagues, in particular in Switzerland, um, we know that if we block that 2A receptor selectively with another pharmaceutical, we take away the psychedelic experience, we take away the mood improving effects of the compound. Um, so the 2A receptor is pretty key for the action of the, um, of the psychedelics. And if you look here, here you have presynaptic and you have the synapse and then you have the postsynaptic. So these receptors are sitting postsynaptically on the receiving neuron. So if you take a drug like MDMA, it would more work over here on the presynaptic side where it would lead to a lot of release of serotonin and less of it taken back. So you would have a lot, a lot of serotonin itself out in the synapse with a drug like uh, MDMA. That's basically a bit the same as antidepressants are doing. They work presynaptically, they increase the levels of serotonin. Psychedelics don't really do that maybe DMT a tiny bit, but the other ones work mainly postsynaptically, so they directly do what serotonin would have done, stimulating the receptors. Um, and here we have um, an average image uh, with PET imaging. I'm going to go a little bit into what PET, PET imaging is, um, but this is a way to actually assess and measure receptors directly in the living brain. Um, and this is an average of more than 100 healthy people, so nothing to do with psychedelics, apart from that it's the psychedelic receptor that you can see. So where you have all the warm colors, that's where you have a lot of receptors, and you can see there's very warm over here, which is the posterior cingulate area, which is a very interesting area. It's a key node in the default mode network. It's very active in self-reflection, and sort of maybe a bit of the place where the ego, at least partially, is sort of uh, located in the brain. 
Um, and one thing we also know is that the more um, the more uh, affinity, the, the better a psychedelic is to stimulate the 2A receptor, the more potent it is as a psychedelic. So that's another sign of, of the importance of that specific receptor. Um, so this is just to mention that the way that we can and do measure receptor systems in the, in the brain is not with MRI, it's with PET imaging. PET is the way that we can access and measure directly molecular processes and pharmacology in the brain. And, and that's unfortunately 10 times more expensive as MRI. And that is, so if there's somebody listening uh, online or out there with a lot of money who want to sponsor some very expensive imaging that would make a lot of sense for this uh, uh, field of science, then be free because we, we are struggling a little bit to get funding for some of that imaging. But anyway, we are doing a PET imaging in other kinds of trials at Imperial. And it basically works. You need a cyclotron to, um, and some physicists to run that. You spin um, 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 particles around and you bombard a, a gas or a liquid in order to make a little isotope that's then incorporated into cold chemistry of the compound that you want to inject into the brain in order to target, label a specific receptor or transporter. And it's also the only way we can actually measure endogenous transmitters in the brain. So if you want to measure dopamine in the brain, if you want to measure serotonin in the brain, you can't really. But you can indirectly by challenging the systems with pharmacological challenges and then do it uh, with PET imaging before and after. That's the way we can measure endogenous neurotransmitters in the brain. And we're also doing that at the moment. I'll come a little bit back to that later. Um, and then you get images like that. That's what you saw before. So that is, oh, sorry. So, um, oh, go the wrong way here. Um, so this is the 2A receptor map of the brain. You can see there's a lot of it in the cortical areas, less in the subcortical areas. You can see it's more dark in the middle. It doesn't mean that there are no 2A receptors. There are 2A receptors, but they're difficult to quantify in, in those areas. It's a bit opposite with the transporter, the one that clears the synapse from, for serotonin. You have a lot of that deep in the brain and, and less densely in the cortical areas, but they're still there in the cortex as well. Um, and this is just because it's a little bit rock and roll. It's actually not really used uh, in, in neuroscience, but it has been tried. You can radio label a lot of things, including crystal meth and cocaine. Um, and then you can see the phar pharmacokinetics of it. You can see the, that Crystal meth stays in a long time in the brain, and you can see where it goes, and you can do the same with cocaine. They are really bad at radio ligands, so they're not really used, but it, I just showed because it's, it's amazing that it can be done. And also, in order to make a little teaser, that what about actually then radio label a psychedelic and measure where does the psychedelic actually go? Because that's not the same as all this MRI we are showing. This is more direct. This is actually taking the molecule, radio label it, see where it goes. And that can be done with PET, and it is done with PET, and we are currently using a psych psychedelic radio tracer. We're just not giving it in, we're not allowed to give it in a psychedelic dose, so we give it in a tiny dose, um, so people don't feel it, but we still label the receptors and can visualize them. And Martin, tomorrow, from the Copenhagen group, he will speak about this uh, tracer. It's one of the end bumps that um, is a, one of the newer psychedelics, but it's, it's very, very good as a... Difficult to use, actually, but pretty good as a radio tracer. Um, yeah, and, and so what do we know about this 2A receptor, and why is it potentially relevant to target it with these agonists that the psychedelics are? Why does it make sense pharmacologically? So if we um, think about depression, if you want to measure this receptor in depression, it's actually a little bit difficult. It sounds easy, but it's difficult because people with depression, they have often, often been treated. Uh, with a lot of pharmaceuticals that act in the serotonin system, and that pollutes the, the ability to actually figure out what's happening with this receptor if they've already received tons of drugs that work on the system. So therefore, sometimes it can be useful to look at healthy people and look at traits related to affective disorders. And one of those traits that we know is a vulnerability marker for developing affective disorder, which means depression, anxiety disorders, um, that is neuroticism. So that's a personality trait. And we, can, we know from a couple of independent studies from the Copenhagen group that 2A receptors, they are upregulated in uh, people who are more neurotic. And not only that, 
also pessimism is related to upregulation of two-way receptors and dysfunctional attitudes and, and negativism. So negative and depression-like traits are related to high expression of the 2A receptor in the brain. And also in rodents, if you make uh, rats really stressed, they upregulate their 2A receptor. And also, if you look at people who died after suicide, they have higher expression of this receptor in their brains. Whereas if you look at the depression literature, it's a bit mixed, and probably partly because of the radio tracers used and also because of the treatment, as I mentioned before, that these people most often have gone through. So, um, but we have actually, at some point, long time ago, measured um, not only two different targets in the serotonin system, the serotonin transporter, and the serotonin transporter is a funny one. It's, it's a bit controversial what it means when it's down, but um, so what we found, these, these people here, the MPU, that's a really great abbreviation, that means MDMA preferring users. So these are overwhelmingly ecstasy users, these guys. These are non drug using controls, and these are psychedelic users. But there's an overlap in the use between those two groups. But anyway, what we can see is that the serotonin transport is markedly reduced in expression in the brains of people who have used a lot of, a lot of MDMA. So a lot of ecstasy means that the serotonin transporter is much less expressed. Whether that is due to damage to the brain, some people claim that people in the science community, some people claim that because they're sitting on you know, the end of the axons, on the nerve terminals, then it, maybe it's because these neurons have been damaged, the axons have been damaged, that's why there are not that many transporters in brains of people who have used a lot of ecstasy. So that's the bad message. The good message, th th there's also some good messages, maybe they, it's only quite extreme users and there seems to be reversibility of this when people haven't used for a long time, at least in some areas of the brain. But that's not the topic of the talk. I'm focusing here, what is the good take-home message is that there doesn't seem to be any effect on these transporters of psychedelic use, which would also be a bit strange. I explained before that psychedelics use, they, they, they work postsynaptically, they don't really work presynaptically where you have this uh, transporter sitting, that's where MDMA works. So it kind of makes sense pharmacological, pharmacologically. But we also measured the, um, this is the, the results in a bar plot, but we also measured the 2A receptor. We didn't use the psychedelic tracer because this is before that was invented. This was uh, a, a non-psychedelic 2A receptor, so it was an antagonist. So it was kind of an anti-psychedelic. Um, and um, what we saw there was that when we combine all these people who use something that either directly or indirectly stimulates the 2A receptor, it's downregulated. So that basically means that, remember before I showed you that neuroticism, negativism, pessimism, all that is 2A receptor upregulated. Here we see the people who have used drugs that work in the recreationally used drugs that work in this uh, serotonergic system. When they do that, that receptor downregulates. And also in in rodent models of with LSD and so on, you can see that you get the 2A receptor to to downregulate. I don't know what your poster shows, Oscar, but that is also part of what you are done, I think. Um, but um, so there might be a post on that topic. I'm not 100% sure. Um, later tonight. Okay, so now I jump directly into something you already heard about because uh, Ross also presented data from our trial, but the thing is, you know, we, 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 we don't have data from the next trial because we haven't started it, so we have to show you the old data now. They're a couple of years old, um, so I'll try not to repeat everything that, that Ross said, but uh, one thing that is important to emphasize is that it's an open label study. That is very important to emphasize. That means that there's no control condition. So there's no control group, no control condition. It was just open label, 20 patients, quite severely depressed that we treated, as Ross mentioned, 10 milligram one week later, 25 milligram of, of psilocybin. So that was the, the design. They were treatment resistant, so they had not responded sufficiently to other treatments for their depression. Some of them had been depressed really long time and tried everything, tons of different antidepressants, minimum from two different classes, and, and all of them basically also a lot of different uh, talking therapies. I mean, as many as there exist, I think, uh, a, a lot of CBT, obviously. So that was the, the trial. We carefully screened them and prepared them in these prep sessions. Uh, Ross also talked about, and then we were very present during the experience. 
and then integration afterwards. So basically this thing about screening, carefully ruling out history of psychosis and so on, um, and making sure people were sort of fit and prepared, that's all about sort of preparing the, the, the set, so the mindset of the, the, the person, and, and then the setting, all the stuff around, the guiding, the environment, the place that we used, all that is something we paid a lot of attention to based on the old literature and also based on our close collaboration with Johns Hopkins group, Matt Johnson, you heard earlier this morning, representing that group uh, here at this meeting. So we were over there before we started doing any of this to work very closely with them and, 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 and uh, harvest some of their experience. Um, this is going more than, I think it's 150 years back in time. This is 1840s. This is just to say that this whole idea of set and setting is actually not new. It didn't really appear in a more medicalized version in the psychedelic treatment society or uh, culture that existed in the 1950s and 60s. That's where Timothy Leary, who worked at, uh, at Harvard University as a psychology professor and did some of the first trials before it all went completely nuts, um, he, termed, he coined that term set and setting, but it actually a, 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 an understanding of something that people actually had understood more than 100 years before in, in, uh, in the middle of Paris, this is in Paris, and this was uh, 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 basically a club where highly intellectual people, including uh, Victor Hugo, Baudelaire, a lot of big uh, authors and, and artists, they met and smoked a lot of weed, and, um, and they were basically um, mentioning exactly the same thing, that the mindset and the setting is incredibly important for the experience, also even with cannabis. And then, this is from the Good Friday experiment in the Marsh Chapel at Harvard, um, where they did in 1962, I think it was, where they did this uh, famous experiment where they gave theology, uh, theology students um, um, psilocybin and evoked very sort of spiritual, profound, uh, mystical and, and um, religious experiences. Um, and of course, when we were designing our setting, we were like, yeah, this is, this is nice. Uh, where do we have something like that? And this is also really nice. This is the Johns Hopkins um, setting um, in Baltimore. Re really pleasant environment. And Robin and I went over there a couple of times. So we have been lying there without psilocybin, unfortunately, but on the couch uh, and, and sort of prepared ourselves and went home and thought we are going to do this in an amazing, in a castle or in a, in a forest or something. And then when we were planning the study, we. <laughs> We, we were ending up with the super clinical facilities and then we uh, decorated them. You might have seen other, some of the other talks. Mental was a great part of that and that's why I put him here because he was also behind putting together the music and he has, as you might know, published interesting stuff about the music and its role in these therapies. But we were two people present constantly around the patient during this trial. And um, Ross has already been mentioning some of this. 20 people, most men most of them severely depressed, um, and, um, and these are the results. You saw them in a bar plot, now you're seeing them in another plot, and, but this is a more time, um, here you have the time uh, element, so you see that basically the, the primary outcome was after one week, which is uh, here, and then the peak uh, um, effect size was after five weeks, which is here, so you can see that, and these are the average scores of self-rated depression using the quits. And you can see depression uh, score dropped dramatically um, uh, in average and for almost, uh, actually for everybody at least at the first week, some people went back. Some, so it would also be strange if, if everybody just remained completely cured for their depression after one dose in a, an entire study. But overall, very um, exciting and promising data that I would say have inspired, uh, I think, quite primarily the, the big uh, um, multi-center trials that are now being set up in, in Europe and also in America that are exactly targeting treatment-resistant depression in massive numbers um, where they have some control conditions with different doses of psilocybin built into the design, which makes it it's stronger than this pilot trial. And um, it was also mentioned by, by uh, I think, uh, actually a couple of times today, both by James but also by Matthew, that the quality, the nature of the psychedelic experience that we can measure 
with different scales using the Johns Hopkins way of doing it is the mystical uh, experience questionnaire and also the uh, altered state of consciousness scale contains some elements that really overlap with this peak mystical um, experience and whatever measure is used and whatever trial they're used in they actually quite consistently seem to contain data showing that the quality of this experience predict the clinical outcomes in the different clinical trials and also in healthy with regard to well-being as Matthew also showed this morning and we also saw that in our trial Leo Roseman published that uh, here um, that um, the, the experience predicted the outcome and this is to say that our trial is not the only one. Um, there might even be a couple of new ones that I haven't added, which I'm sorry about if I have missed some, but, but um, these trials are all in symptoms related to uh, affective disorder, end of life, anxiety, depression, and depression itself, and with uh, and anxiety. So those symptoms have been tried in these relatively small, I mean the Johns Hopkins and also uh, the Ross study, they are bigger and they are better controlled uh, with methylphenidate as a, a positive control and, and they all show quite promising data. So it's not only our trial. This was also briefly mentioned by James that we are not only doing lab-based experimental uh, trials, we are also trying to harvest knowledge and, and experiences from out in the real world because as you very well know these drugs are, are used uh, a lot and have been used for thousands of years um, and now that we have the internet we are trying to exploit that by putting out online surveys and then let people because it's stronger you can go out and ask people about past experiences that that's still good and interesting but probably even more interesting a little bit more st strong science is it to try to do it prospectively so you're like if you plan to do something you can sign up and then we are basically measuring things online before people do the drug and around the time of the drug and then follow up. Um, and that we are doing in different studies. Um, Hannes, who has a poster, is doing the ceremony study. Um, this is the, the one that um, James was showing data from. This is the second version of it, so it's still going on. People can still sign up for it. And then we have some new microdosing studies um, um, this one was a self-blinding version and then Mental Kalin's uh, setting study together with David who's also here at the meeting, they're doing that trial. So we have all these online trials and soon we will have a 5-MeO one hopefully also specifically for 5-MeO DMT. Um, so this one, that's the only one where we have any data from yet. We have taken data out from this trial to look at what's happening. You saw some of them already from James, but this is specifically about the symptoms, basically, to sh do we see the same as we did in our controlled lab-based trial? And as you can see, we kind of do. We see that um, the quit score, which is the depression score, they go down significantly. This is the uh, significance, uh, the p-values are low, so they go down dramatically. Um, in, in these online surveys as well. And also the STI, which is Spielberger trait um, anxiety, so that is a, an anxiety measure, also goes down. And what we and this is just basically to illustrate it. So people are not necessarily depressed. This is not a depressed trial, but people rate their depression. So we can basically categorize people in people who rate baseline quite a lot of depressive symptoms and, and so forth. So we can divide them into um, mild, not depressed, mild, uh, moderate, and severely depressed. Um, and when you do that, you can see the ones that really go down in depression score, which kind of makes sense, is, are the ones that are quite depressed from the beginning, and the same with anxiety. In, in addition to that, when we look, as we did in, the, in our lab trial, we see also here indications, at least borderline significant indications, that that uh, the more mystical experience people had, the more their depressive symptoms went down. And more significant is it with anxiety. So the higher scores they had, the more peak-like spiritual, profound mystical experience they had, the more the anxiety dropped. Um, and also, which is a bit interesting, the more challenging experience they had, the more the anxiety went down. This is very preliminary, the group doesn't even know it, I think. But um, So that's a bit, uh, little bit surprising, but it goes hand in hand with maybe that people actually understood that they were a sky rather than a weather, something that Ross was saying, that might be why they 
they, uh, they went through the, the storm, but they stayed as a sky, and therefore they actually came stronger out of it. Um, yeah, and then this is about um, whether the dose had an effect, and it did. So the high doses of when people reported using a higher dose, then they, are, they were the one that went down in depression most. So people with a lower dose, less so. And also, did they go into it with a therapeutic motive? So did they rate that they did it for a therapeutic purpose, or did they not? If they did, they, they got more therapy out of it, um, and the depression uh, went down more than if they didn't have a therapeutic motive. Um, and then just a little advertisement about the, this trial that um, I have um, been behind together with Balas Shigeti, from, who is based in New York. This, I don't know if somebody of you already met it online, maybe. If I'm lucky, then you have. If you haven't, then maybe you will all consider it. Um, it's a pretty complex trial where people basically self-blind them. So it's a microdosing trial, completely different paradigm. Microdosing are tiny doses, and they're used on a regular basis, a couple of times a week over a period. So it's different from the high-dose, one-off sessions, um, but the, it's the same drug. So this is an LSD-based self-blinding microdosing trial where people, they can sign up online and then they take their microdose and put them into some capsules and they put the capsules together with some barcodes into some bags and into some envelopes and then the envelopes are mixed up if they follow the manual and then they end up not knowing whether they for four weeks take placebo or whether they take LSD microdosing or whether they take a couple of weeks of both. And then we can break the blind through an app on their phone with the barcode. Pretty cool, I'm just saying. Um, but uh, we'll see if it works. But the idea is good, I think. It's not my idea. Um, OK, so a little bit about the brain imaging data, uh, the fMRI. I was mentioning earlier the stuff we have seen in healthy. What did we see in the patients? This is difficult to directly compare for the reason that all the work we have been doing in the healthy have been acute during the acute experience. So it has been while we were giving psilocybin in the scanner. This is different because this was a therapy study. We gave an oral dose. That's a big difference from an intravenous dose, much longer duration. And we were sitting there with people. So they were not in a scanner. They were in this sort of nice environment we tried to create in this hospital room rather than in a scanner. Um, and what we saw was that the, the cerebral blood flow that you can measure with arterial spin labeling with MRI, it went down in particular in um, temporal regions, including the amygdala, and the amygdala decrease in blood flow predicted the, or correlated with the treatment response, so with the decrease in depressive symptoms. Now, now we're back at the lab-based study with the imaging data. Um, and it's interesting also, oh, Sorry, because uh, amygdala has in several studies in depression been, sh been shown to be hyperactivated. So here we saw a decrease in activation that was correlating with the treatment outcome published by Robin. Um, and, and then looking at the functional connectivity using the bold signal with the MRI, we could see that there was a decrease in the functional connectivity between the parahippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Again, those temple regions where uh, pre, uh, um, parahippocampus is, is located, those connections with frontal regions, they have in a lot of studies been shown to be hyper-connected in depression. And here we saw a decrease. And again, we saw a relationship with uh, outcome. So the treatment response here it was at five weeks. It correlated with that. So they are early studies, uh, early data. And of course, it's difficult to look at correlations in a quite small sample. So there's that uh, to put in as a significant limitation. Um, then Matthew also mentioned that this one session or two with high doses of a psychedelic, it sort of constitutes a new paradigm, very different to normal treatments of mental health, where you take a drug every day for a long time, months, years, the rest of your life. This is one-off treatments, and what is fascinating as uh, Matthew also pointed out, which I very much agree with, that is what is deeply fascinating, is that it seems to be long-lasting. So he showed data from their trial. This is data from all the trials that I could find, all the different clinical trials. So we are, 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 are doing a, a review paper together with Christopher, who is also here at the conference, looking at uh, how uh, 
sustained the um, therapeutic effects are in these trials. Even though they are early on, they are pilot trials, still interesting. And if you compare it with ketamine, ketamine has become a sort of revolution in, men, in, in treatment of, of treatment-resistant depression. It, it works very well, but it looks like it's much shorter acting. Again, it also depends on whether you have how it's controlled and so on. But this, I think, is a study conducted very similar to the way our studies have been conducted. And you can see that the, the symptoms, they go back up, um, whereas in with the uh, classic psychedelics, they stay low for a sustained period, which is very interesting. One of the things that are interesting to look at in that regard is personality, because personality is supposed to be a trait, and Matthew also said this is stable or life, or it's supposed to be, but what happens with the psychedelics? It can be questioned whether it's stable or life. I'll get back to that on the next slide. But first, these are, this is the classical way of assessing personalities using the big five, big five personality traits or domains, and one of them, as you heard about in Matthew's talk a bit, is openness, and then you have the other ones, neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And they can be sort of put into a higher hierarchy if you do other kind of factor analysis and you reduce the factors to two. Then they seem to group a bit so that those three go together uh, and are related to stability. Of course, the inverse version of neuroticism. And then uh, extroversion and openness together um, covers a higher um, hierarchy domain of plasticity. And openness is related to, to aesthetical appreciations. It, it covers sort of two things, both intellect, intelligence, intellectuality, but also more perceptual openness to appreciate things around you and also openness towards other people's viewpoints and ways of thinking. So that is openness um, trait for you. And as uh, again was shown by the Johns Hopkins group, Catherine McLean showed that openness significantly increased in healthy people. Um, we showed it in, um, in uh, but that was just after two weeks, so not very long follow-up with LSD, also increased openness. And a thing to keep in mind here is that um, depression itself is related to higher neuroticism, but typically lower openness and uh, lower extroversion compared to non-depressed patients. Um, and uh, we have seen in a sample in Denmark, this is in review right now, so hopefully soon coming out. So this is from the brain imaging study done in Copenhagen that, the years ago, that the psychedelic users in, uh, specifically, they had higher openness. So across three groups, five different traits. The only thing that differed was that openness was higher among the people who use psychedelics. And actually, it correlated with the lifetime use of psychedelics, which might be a problem if you use it a lot, because maybe you become too open, and because openness also correlates with um, schizotypical, typical, schizotypal personality uh, problems. Okay, so is it stable? As Matthew said, now I'm gonna challenge Matthew, they are not really completely stable. They do slightly change over lifespan. Um, so uh, people become more confident, agreeable, conscientious, and emotionally stable. Emotionally stable is sort of the inverse of neuroticism. So less neurotic, more emotional stable with age. But does that happen gradually, or could it happen in steps? How do we know? If we just assess at two different time points, it might look like, oh, this person over the last 30 years have gradually changed the personality? Or could it be that it happens with life events that have a deep impact on people? And uh, here I would, would um, actually quote something that I think Matthew wrote or said some years back that I kind of like, inverse PTSD idea. I mean, if you can ruin your life from a really negative traumatic experience, it changes your brain wiring and it changes your psychology, then why shouldn't a deeply profound, meaningful, spiritual experience not potentially be able to do the opposite of actually push you uh, and push your personality. And there are some some interesting um, thoughts about that and some publications about quantum change, the same ideas. Um, in our trial, we did assess personality at baseline and also at three months, and this is what we saw, this is baseline. So here we have, this is again our depression trial, still the 20 people with depression uh, in our lab that we gave psilocybin. Um, at baseline, they were uh, more neurotic 
Um, so the, the, the black one is norm data. So it's not controlled from our, but it's control, controls from literature. And the red is the baseline. This is how they started out. So they were exactly as they should be as depressed patients, unfortunately for them, uh, more neurotic and less conscientious, less extrovert, and openness was kind of normal. And that's probably, they were in a normal depression sample, they might have been less open, but people who sign up for this kind of stuff at this stage in the history of science, they are pretty open. Um, so that's probably why they were relatively open from the beginning. Um, we also know that from imaging studies in Copenhagen that people are quite open when they sign up for trials. Um, and uh, then this is then how the personality uh, were modulated after three months. So when we reassessed personality with this 240 questionnaire, Neopia, which is the sort of standard way to assess the big five, then people had decreased in neuroticism and increased in, in extroversion um, and borderline conscientiousness. And then they had, had actually, even though they were pretty open from the beginning, they had still significantly become even more open um, after these three months. So that's very much in agreement with Catherine McLean's data from the healthy that you saw before. And um, so this is down into a more geeky detail. You can read oh, you can uh, read it if you're interested in the paper in more detail about the different facets, so these sub-fractions of the domains that would change significantly in this population. Um, and then something that's a bit interesting is that if we if we just have depressed patient and we treat them with whatever treatment, we treat them with SSRIs or talking therapy, and if we measure personality before and after, does that then change? Yes, it does change because there's a bit arbitrary, this thing about trait and state. So people's traits, domains, when you measure them with personality assessment, they do change when you treat the depression. And this is so from a big, big meta-analysis, then I dragged out everything that had been measured with the same uh, method as we measured. Um, so these are trials, all the, this white section here. This is treatment with different antidepressants for uh, different periods. And you can see that the, the light blue section here, that's the average from these trials, that people significantly decreased in neuroticism. And you can see our data, this is the darker blue, that's our data, so it's very similar. So basically, we did the same as we would have probably done if we had treated them with whatever treatment. But extroversion is m double, more than double uh, as much changed, and uh, openness is three times more changed in the psilocybin treatment of depression than what you would expect from just treating depression with other treatments. Um, and then again, back to the online survey, I jumped before forth and back between the lab-based study, very controlled, where we sat with people, that's the data you just saw, and then now we are back on the online survey uh, where we used a very simplified uh, measure of personality. Instead of 240 items, we just used a 10-item version. And what we saw here was quite similar, that people, this is the more graphical way of showing it. And pay attention to this. So here, this is openness. This is a, a, a emotional stability, which is the op opposite of neuroticism. So you, people increased in emotional stability. The, one, the ones that uh, were um, depressed from the beginning, they increased in emotional stability, exactly as you would exchange, uh, expect. That means decreased in neuroticism. And consensus is nothing really happened in extroversion. Again, the people with depression increased in extroversion. But if you look at openness, they are very parallel. That means it didn't really matter whether people were depressed or not depressed, they equally increased in openness. And that shows you that probably this thing about openness is quite specific for what some of the, what, what the psychedelics can induce and facilitate, because otherwise that would just have been in, in the depressed population. And that goes very much um, hand in hand in what we saw in the lab-based study. And you'll see more of brand new data from Copenhagen about the same topic and extra stuff tomorrow. So this is the last slide. And this is just uh, some of the things that we are either doing or wanting to do. And this one I put in, in uh, italic or whatever it's called because we didn't get the money to do that. So it's a very expensive study. This is all PET that we would like to do. But uh, so we still hope to be able to find funding to measure 2A receptors in depression and see what happens to the receptor levels, the receptor regulation after we treat with psilocybin, whether this is important to downregulate the receptor.
and, and then we are, measure, we are doing that right now in depression, but without psilocybin. Instead, we are giving amphetamine to release serotonin, and we can actually, with the first method ever, measure the brain's own levels of serotonin. This is the first method ever that seems to work. So we're doing that right now in depression and, and s trying to see whether that predicts treat treatment outcome to SSRI treatment. And then, as I mentioned already, I won't go into that again, we're doing, the t uh, Chris is doing a DMT study, and we are doing all these different microdosing trials, one in a lab and the other ones online. And then uh, we are going on, as Ross also mentioned, with the next level of psilocybin for depression, Silodep 2, which is now going to be more controlled, randomized study. So that was it. Thanks a lot to all the colleagues involved in all this work. Thank you.